Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this is a lecture for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. In this, we're looking at Chapter 5 on Middle Childhood and Section 3 on the Development of Intelligence and Creativity in Middle Childhood. The first thing we want to look at is theories of intelligence. And so we got a kid here with a tie on with math in the back, so he must be a very intelligent person. Um, intelligence has been a, a major field in psychology for a long, long time. Uh, most of the people who deal with intelligence are what are called, uh, well, people who are involved in the measurement of intelligence are called psychometricians, it's psychometrics. Uh, one of the biggest people in this field was a guy named David Weschler. And Weschler um, defined intelligence really in a, in a pretty um, simple way. He said, intelligence is the capacity to understand the world and the resourcefulness to cope with its challenges. And I think most people would agree with that one. Um, also, intelligence is often associated with things like academic success, advancement on the job, and appropriate social behavior. So regardless of its origins, intelligence is usually perceived as a child's underlying competence or learning ability. However, it can be helpful to distinguish intelligence from uh, what is usually called achievement which has more to do with the acquired performance or competence as opposed to simply underlying propensities or potential abilities. Now, there's a lot of different theories about intelligence. For instance, you have what are called factor theorists. Uh, these people view intelligence as consisting of one or more major mental abilities uh, or factors. Uh, the best known of these was from a long time ago is Charles Spearman. Um, I would say 20s or 30s comes to mind. And he suggested that intelligent behaviors have a common underlying factor that he called G for general intelligence. That represented broad reasoning and problem solving abilities and that people who were very high in this, regardless of their field, had more in common with each other than they did with people who were very low, even though those people might share their same field. On the other hand, uh, other people, uh, Robert Sternberg, who's still around, uh, had a three-part or tripartite theory of intelligence. Uh, that he defined as analytical intelligence, which you might think of as the basic, you know, science, math kind of thing. Uh, creative intelligence, the ability to make new things. Um, and practical intelligence, stuff that's very much in the real world. Um, or, as this slide shows, we're talking about something developed by Howard Gardner, who's also still around. And Howard Gardner is best known for his theory of multiple intelligences. And here we have nine of them, the linguistic, which is, you know, standard verbal, logical, mathematical, fine. Naturalist, which I usually think of more as, again, as I've said elsewhere, like somebody who lives in the forest and knows all the plants and how to work with them, although we have a person in a biology lab here. Uh, then we also have spatial with a sculptor here and the bodily kinesthetic and the musical. Uh, and the idea, these are distinct things. And then finally, the guy looking at himself in the mirror, that's intrapersonal, meaning understanding yourself. There's interpersonal, understanding other people. And existential, really having to do more with, you might say, philosophical or spiritual or religious matters. Um, now, Gardner did not come up with these because he thought, it, you know, people might feel bad if they weren't good at math and they needed something they could feel, you know, good about. Instead, he says intelligence reflects sort of these distinct academic abilities and said that each one of these has its own neurological basis. It has what's called neurophysiological isolation, takes place in a different part of the brain. Also, they have what are called different developmental tra tra trajectories that people, for instance, develop verbal long before they develop the logical mathematical. Um, and that interpersonal might come before the ability to develop intrapersonal, you know, that they, they develop at different times. Also, he talked about the existence of people who were savants or prodigies, people who are astoundingly good at one of these things, but not necessarily others. And a savant would actually be very poor at a lot of the others. Anyhow, uh, while it's still an open debate, it is an interesting thing because it lets you know that there is, might be more to intelligence than just this single, you know, smart versus dumb factor. Okay, now about the test. What we have right here is the Stanford Binet Intelligence Test that was developed way back in the 30s uh, for testing young children. So this one also is a very common scale, and David Weschler developed what's called the Weschler Intelligence Scale for for children, or the WISC, and the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale called the WACE. And um, these are among the most widely used and the most widely respected intelligence tests. So the Stanford Binet, the Weschler Scales, these yield scores called intelligence questions, that's IQs. 
And you can see the test consists of more than just asking questions, you know, what's seven times 14, stuff like that. Instead, a substantial portion consists of performance tasks in which the respondent actually does the thing in question as opposed to, for instance, describing it verbally. Now, today's scores on the Stanford Binet are, are derived by comparing children's and adults' performances with those of other people on the same age. So people who get more items correct than average for their age and group get IQ scores above 100. Those who answer fewer items correctly, they get scores, again, for their age, get scores below 100. Okay, the Wechsler scales, um, these have a bunch of tests questions that are grouped into subtests that measure different intellectual tasks. So for this reason, subtests compare a person's performance on one type of task, such as, for instance, putting the words in uh, the pictures in the order to tell a coherent story. You know, so for instance, the guy needs to get in his car first, and then he needs to catch the fish, then he cleans it, then he cooks it, you know. Um, or you can say what's missing in the watch, we're missing the hour hand, and how to arrange the blocks, and how to make a picture. Um, so anyhow, in the Weschler scales, subtests compare a person's performance on one type of task, such as defining words, with another, such as using blocks to construct geometric designs. And these scales suggest that children, uh, they suggest children's strengths and weaknesses in different areas, as well as provide overall measures of, intell of intellectual functioning. On the other hand, you do have the problem with cultural bias. Um, for instance, in the Wester Scales, you're going to have to understand fishing. You're going to have to know what a, a wristwatch looks like. And if you grew up with digital watches, you, can, you might have a harder time with that one. So if scoring well on an intelligence test requires a certain kind of cultural experience, like fishing or, or wristwatches, the tests are said to have a cultural bias. And so for this reason, a lot of other psychologists and psychometricians have worked uh, really hard to try to construct culture-free or at least less biased intelligence tests, or also time culture fair. Uh, so for instance, you see that these ones here are these very abstract patterns and shapes, and you don't have to know what the big and little hands on a watch look like in order to be able to answer these particular questions. And so this is a variation on intelligence testing that allows you to get beyond the particular bounds of the group for whom the test was originally developed. Next, we have patterns in the development of intelligence. And so once children reach middle childhood, they they under they appear to undergo relatively stable patterns of gains in intellectual functioning, although they're still growth spurs. So for instance, you see the the group in blue at the top, you got this group that just shoots way up, and the group in red that drops way down. Um, on the other hand, that biggest change is around nine or ten years old, so you're getting the most difference between groups at that time. On the other hand, it basically looks like most of the groups catch up by the time they're teenagers. And so the difference is not nearly as big by the time they've reached 17 as it is around the time they're 10. And again, a person may be tested with an IQ of 160 when they're 10, but chances are they'll be tested at something more like 130, 135 when they're a teenager. So again, the IQ scores have a whole lot to do with your current age when you took it. Um, on the other hand, because we have this sort of this compression over time um, and things become more stable, intelligence tests can gain some greater predictive power. Um, on the other hand, a lot of things influence IQ scores, such as changes in the home, socioeconomic uh, circumstances, and obviously the kind of education that's available to you. And so a lot of people treat IQ as this thing that's sort of built in and it's always with you, but it's, it's really responsive to a lot of these external influences. The next one is about intellectual deficiency and giftedness. And here we have a bell curve that's typically used to describe intelligence. And so it's centered on a score of 100 because that's what the average is by definition. Uh, and you see that it goes down to, for instance, below 70 and above 130. And really, the range from 90 to 110, or sometimes, depending on who you ask, 85 to 115, it's basically normal. It's, it's within the normal range. And also because there's a lot of things like environment and nutrition and, you know, again, that can influence scores. Normal, basically there. Uh, we got the this cute term dull normal and borderline at the bottom and above average is superior and then intellectually deficient and very superior at the far end. Now, intellectual deficiency has a technical definition here. It's the inability 
It is a disability characterized by significant limitations, both in intellectual functioning and in adaptive behavior, as expressed in conceptual, social, and practical adaptive skills. So giftedness, for instance, involves more than excellence on the tasks provided by standard intelligence tests. In determining who's gifted, uh, most educators include children who have outstanding abilities, are capable of high performance in a specific academic area, such as language or mathematics, or show creativity, leadership, distinction in the visual or performing arts, or bodily talent, such as uh, gymnastics and dancing. So there's a lot of different things that are used to consider who is uh, above average, who's below average, and um, it can be really context specific. Now, in terms of differences in intellectual development, one of the interesting things is that, yes, it's true, Asian and Asian American students often do better um, on a lot of standardized tests. But part of this, uh, you know, you might say there's something genetic about it, and I don't know, but there's also that um, in a lot of Asian cultures, not all of them, but a lot of them, Academic success is attributed to hard work as opposed to innate giftedness, and so there's going to that's going to facilitate uh, really people working hard and persisting. And so we might have more uh, that the performance could be traced simply to working harder than other things. So, but let me say, IQ scores there are differences between socioeconomic groups, ethnic groups. Now, the fact that the groups the differences exist does not explain why the differences are there. That's that's a whole other issue. But you do see that lower class American children uh, tend to attain IQ scores that are 10 to 15 points lower, which is a fair amount than those of middle and upper class children. Also, African American, Latin American, Native American children all tend to score below the norms for European uh, Americans. And on the other hand, Asian, Asian American students often perform better. And again, Saying that these differences exist is in no way an explanation. In fact, the explanations for these things are often very complex, but a lot of it's going to be tied in with opportunities um, and the support for academic achievement in each of these groups. And that opens up really a much larger conversation about these. But the recognition that there are, on average, some group differences serves as a starting point for that conversation. Next, creativity. And then we have here that Creativity and innovation, uh, some people say, requires a lot of intelligence. Um, so creativity is the ability to do things that are both novel, meaning you know it's new, hasn't been done before, and useful. It actually works, um, such as uh, solving problems when there's no pre-existing solution, no tried and tested formulas. And the tests used to measure intelligence and creativity Interestingly, they only show a moderate relationship between IQ scores and measures of creativity. So being smart, uh, at least as far as standardized tests goes, and being creative are different things. And there's a whole lot more that we could say about that one later. Next, we have here a little uh, chart of relatedness and how correlated things are. And so what we have here is a whole group of... Um, different degrees of relatedness. So for instance, you could talk about identical twins reared together have 100% genetic overlap. Uh, on the other hand, identical twins reared apart, they have the genetic overlap, but they don't have the social and, or environmental overlap. And so what you see is that identical twins reared together have a correlation in intelligence of about 0.85. What's funny about that is that really, um, you have to square these things to understand them. So even though they have the identical uh, genetics and race in the same environment, that Similarity only ex predicts 70% of the variance in the scores. It's not as much as you would think. Uh, but you see, as the degrees of relatedness and environmental similarity go down, things be uh, become more and more uh, divergent. So studies suggest that the heritability or you know genetic inheritance of intelligence is between 40, 60%, and actually 50 is a good estimate. Um, this means about half the difference between IQ scores could be due to genetics. So classic studies found stronger relationships between IQ scores of adopted children and their biological parents than between the IQ, IQ scores of adopted children and their adoptive parents. Um, also, research shows the positive effects of enriched early environments created by having responsive parents who provide appropriate play materials and varied experiences. And that's going to work into a whole lot of things. Again, it has a lot more, there's a lot of 
uh, things in terms of intelligence, in terms of creativity, has a lot to do with these social factors, these environmental uh, affordances, and the things that are made available to people. Anyhow, that's where we're going to end this particular section.